All right, well, let's get started. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, welcome to uh, Empirical Methods this semester. I'm actually really, really excited to have you here uh, this semester because this is a very rare course. Um, so it's a very selfish course for me. It's, it's, you know, I've been publishing papers now. I was just thinking about this the other day. I've been uh, publishing papers for 10 years. It's my uh, 10th anniversary, a 10 year anniversary of my first published research paper uh, this year, 2021. And you know, I really wish somebody would have offered a course like this when I started doing research. Um, I, this course is essentially a distillation of the you know, things that I learned, 10 years worth of things that I learned uh, kind of by doing uh, as a researcher. Uh, and I can't wait to share all, all of these with you uh, over the course of the semester. Um, and surprisingly, there's not more uh, courses like this. I don't know why uh, this is such a rare course. There's a few notable ones. So first off, uh, I have to acknowledge uh, Jim Hertzleb and, and Marcelo Cataldo, who sort of started doing this at CMU. Um, the current version, the one I'm giving this year, is, is much changed relative to the one I gave uh, two years ago, uh, which was already uh, changed relative to what they had before. But they started uh, this tradition at CMU. And I was looking around for inspiration and for ideas to, to, to steal and import for, for our course. Um, and there's very few courses that I found uh, elsewhere that are similar to this. And if you uh, know of more, please let me know, because I'm, I'm really interested in learning from how other people are, are doing this and so seeing what, what else we can um, import uh, for, uh, for our course here. Uh, there's a few notable ones. There's a really good one by Steve Easterbrook and Barbara uh, Neves that I think was discontinued, was offered a few years ago at the University of Toronto. Um, Laura Dabish in ACI currently offers in the fall semester um, a very good course similar to this one on applied research methods. So if you're sort of uh, the fall schedule aligns better, uh, you know, with, with your or other people's schedules, um, do let them know about this. There's one that Peggy Story just started um, last fall at the University of Victoria in Canada. Uh, our very own graduate, Ray Zhao, is, is teaching a, a version of this at the University of Toronto this year. But by and large, I, I just couldn't find sort of courses like, like these. Uh, I, I, my feeling is, my gut instinct is that there, there ought to be some. I just don't know of them. So if you can think of them, do, do let me know. Um, there's one that I'm really, really excited about. So like, um, this is for when you're bored and have nothing better to do than you know, read research papers, write research papers, uh, papers whatever. Check out the course uh, uh, called Calling Bullshit from University of Washington. It's a fantastic course. Um, I, 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 wish, I wish ours was that sort of you know, uh, uh, interesting and, and sort of well, well uh, executed uh, as theirs. Uh, so do take a look at this. They sort of talk about how you can, um, you can learn to recognize bullshit in, um, uh, so it's more oriented towards like general media and uh, popular media and things like this. But, but do take a look at this, it's really interesting. Uh, all right, so what I'd like to do today is to um, just have a brief introduction to the topic, just so that we kind of know what uh, what this is going to be about. Uh, and then I want to meet you all, and I want you all to meet each other uh, and sort of get a sense of why you're here and, and what I could do to make this course more uh, interesting and useful for you. Um, and we're going to go over sort of the course logistics and how I'm planning on, on running this uh, towards the end. So that's sort of the rough plan for this. Um, how am I, oh, I can't really see the chat window. So like, if you could, ah, yeah, okay. So CJ, uh, this is, thank you for bringing this up. Um, you can pin my little thumbnail. If you pin my thumbnail, um, it's gonna make it take up the whole screen. And then, and then hopefully that will uh, be much more readable. Does that work? Right, so what I'm doing here, this is a sort of complicated hack. I'm using this green screen so that I could blend myself into the slides. Uh, but that means technically that I'm not sharing uh, a screen through Zoom right now. I sort of have this virtual uh, camera that kind of builds all of this in. Uh, so that's why it sort of looks different on, on your end. I'm sorry about the confusion here. But I think, I think if you just pin my thumbnail, it should kind of recreate the, um, um, the general feel of, of like traditional screen sharing. Okay, does that work? 
Okay, good. Um, and right, so I can't always, uh, the little chat window is a little bit far from, uh, from where I'm sitting. So I can't really see that. If you have something to say, we're a small class, just, just say it, it's, it's okay. Like we're not a big enough class for this to be a problem. Just, you know, use your microphone and, and interrupt me and like say whatever, uh, because I can't really see the, the chat wall. Okay. All right, so, uh, oops. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of where where this fits in. So let's say, uh, let's see how close to uh, kind of your uh, profile and, and research plan any of these things uh, are. So perhaps you're trying to understand how some set of uh, practitioners, be it software engineers or designers or what have you, um, are working and what challenges they face. So you're you're maybe you're maybe doing research to understand something, understand how the world works, or understand uh, challenges faced by practitioners or things like that. Maybe um, you have already identified some challenges. You sort of have an idea for what some some problems are, and you're looking to inform the design of some possible solutions. You're like you, you know what the problems are and you want to solve some problems, but you're sort of uh, exploring the design space and you're looking for um, so how to choose between uh, possible solutions in an in, informed manner. Or maybe you're even further along. Maybe you've already created something, you've built something, you've built a, a tool, a process, a programming language, a system, an algorithm, what have you. You've, you've developed something, you've built something, you've created something. Uh, and now the question is, you know, how, how good is it? How well does it work? How, how well does it serve its, its purpose? So you're looking to evaluate this. Right? So these are so some typical scenarios where um, uh, empirical methods come in, where, you know, questions that have to do with empirical methods and that have to do with this class come in. So, for example, you might be um, trying to figure out, you know, how to collect some data, right? So like, what's a good way to collect data to study a, a particular phenomenon? Uh, once you have some data, right, you're asking, how do you analyze it? Like, what are, what are sound ways to, to look at this data? And there's different kinds of data and so on. Like, what are the most rigorous and appropriate ways to analyze this data? Um, maybe you're looking to compare different alternatives or, or possible solutions or even existing solutions, right? So how do you collect evidence that one particular approach is better than another? This is sort of a very common question that, that comes up. Um, once you've done some work, you've built something, you're looking to uh, provide evidence that, it, that it's useful, that it, um, that it functions um, according to, uh, to, its, to its goals and so on, that it, that it adds some value, right? How do you do this? Like what constitutes sufficient evidence to back up your, your claims? How do you draw conclusions from, uh, from pieces of evidence like this? So these are sort of core questions that come up uh, in research. Do any of these, uh, like ring a bell at all like this do is anybody here um that does not recognize any of these things as as sort of uh, occurring in their own research i'm seeing kind of Sleepy faces, I know, me too. Thank you for turning your uh, cameras on, by the way. I really appreciate sort of seeing faces. It's really awkward for the presenter, the speaker, to look at an empty screen. So I really thank you for this. I really appreciate seeing you, actually. So uh, sleepy or not, or PJs or not, you know, whatever. You could, you could do whatever. It doesn't matter. But I really appreciate seeing you. All right. So I guess the core question that... Um, empirical methods so is useful for, like uh, learning about empirical methods is useful for, is this question of how do you validate your claims? Like all of you, I bet cash uh, in your research papers, uh, which is presumably the, the reason why you're in, in grad school is to, to write research papers, to publish research papers. Uh, presumably all of you in your research papers are making claims about something, about the uh, usefulness of a particular thing that you've invented or what have you. You're making claims about something, about the importance of a problem, about you know, anything at all really, about the, the benefit of some approach over another. And 
the core question that this entire course is about, essentially, the, kind of the, the core question at the core of everything is how do you validate the claims that you're making in a research paper, right? It, this is what we will be essentially uh, talking about the entire semester. How do you validate the claims you're making? Right? No matter the reasons for doing a study, uh, you sort of have to think about how you're gonna validate the, the claims that you're making. And I claim uh, without any validation here uh, that um, this is the number one reason why papers get rejected. Um, it's not because the thing you have um, invented or written about is not interesting enough or is not, uh, uh, I don't know, what have you enough. It's not because of any of these I claim, but I claim that most often your papers will be rejected or people's papers will be rejected because the, um, uh, the claims the authors are making in the paper do not align with the evidence the authors have provided. I'm claiming that this is the number one reason why your papers are likely to be rejected, no matter the topic of your papers, right? So as I'm hoping to, uh, if, if you take something away from this course, it's, it's this kind of uh, learning to um, properly, appropriately align the claims you are making or planning to make with the kind of evidence that you're uh, willing and able to provide to support them and to not make uh, claims that are not um, aligned with the evidence you're providing. So um, I, the, the one bit answer to this, the one bit summary of this course is that it depends really. Uh, like there's no one size fits all solution. I'm sorry, it's there's not like one magic uh, silver uh, bullet method uh, thing that you could always do to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to make, to create perfect research. It's not like this. Uh, the answer is uh, it, it depends. It depends on lots of things. Um, turns out there's a diversity of methods available. Um, they're used in many forms and in many phases of research. They're used to understand the problem. They're used to understand practice. They're used to demonstrate the utility of a particular solution. Um, they all have their own standards and techniques for rigor. And um, what I'm hoping this course will do is sort of uh, expose you to uh, what these are and sort of uh, embed these standards and techniques for rigor uh, in your mind so that you, you sort of know what to expect when you're, when you're seeing them or when you're applying them yourselves. Um, the bad news, is that all methods are flawed. Okay. Um, I'm sorry about this too. Like if you're hoping for, like again, you know, silver bullet thing here, uh, I don't have it. All methods are flawed. Uh, I, I dare, I challenge you to, to, to prove me wrong, uh, to claim otherwise. Uh, but the good news is that they can still be useful uh, when applied correctly. Uh, there's still lots of uh, science to be done and lots of knowledge to be built by correctly applying research methods. Um, and so I guess uh, what we will be doing throughout the semester and starting today is thinking and talking about uh, how to select methods. So given different things, right? So when do we do what? And then so once you've selected a method, how do you implement it? How do you apply it uh, properly and, and rigorously? Right, so selection depends on lots of things. Depends on kind of the, the overall approach to research. We're going to talk about this in a second. The nature of the contribution you're trying to, uh, trying to make, the specific research questions you're asking, the state of knowledge in general about that, that particular problem or phenomenon, other things as well. There's lots of variables here that inform your selection of methods. And we're going to talk about how, how all of these things fit together. So here's one way to think about uh, research approaches and methods. Um, so when we talk about research methods or methodologies here, this is a, probably the most familiar term to you. I'm sure you've sort of uh, uh, heard of this distinction before, I, I, distinction between qualitative methods and quantitative methods. I'm sure this is uh, familiar to you to, to some extent. Um, this is a continuum. It's important to note this. It's not um, it's not sort of a, a binary uh, thing here. You're either a qualitative, a method is either qualitative or it's quantitative. It's a continuum. It could be anything in between, but these are sort of the extremes for, uh, for simplicity purposes here. Uh, to one step higher, there's also kind of approaches to research. How do you think about research? Like regardless of a method you're choosing, so how do you approach uh, a research project? 
Um, and this is maybe less familiar. So I'll, I'm going to talk about this for, for a minute. Uh, here, the ends of this other continuum are um, so inductive research on the one hand versus deductive research on the other hand. Okay, so the deductive approach to research is the one that you're maybe most familiar with. Uh, this is sort of a traditional form of, of research, kind of scientific method is a deductive as an example of deduct a deductive approach to research. Um, traditional empirical science, when somebody says empirical science, that's sort of, they, they probably, probably mean something like a deductive approach to research. So the assumptions here are that there is some external reality, okay? There's some real world that exists independent of the researcher. This is important. There's some objective reality out there, okay? Um, and you can understand this reality by collecting objective unbiased data about it. Um, okay, so emphasis on objective here throughout all of this. Okay. How do people build knowledge? By kind of increasingly furthering their understanding uh, of the causal workings of the universe of the world uh, and their, their insights into the causal workings of the world. So this sort of, uh, you know, think of the natural sciences essentially. Like uh, these are, uh, essentially all of them are examples of uh, a deductive approach to research, and uh, you know that's why they're referred to as the scientific method. Okay, and um, here th these things tend to be reductionistic in nature. So they're sort of top down. You start with some some abstract concepts, um, and you kind of re reduce those down to observable and measurable things and, and data in some particular context, um, and the uh, traditional research questions here have to do with testing a cause and effect relationship, typically. This is a very common uh, research question in this style of research, of testing a cause and effect relationship that uh, underpins a certain phenomenon. Okay. Um, so, like, how do people do this? You start, you know, you start with some concepts and theory, you derive some hypothesis, you collect some data, you test the hypothesis, you, I don't know, use statistics or something. Um, the findings may either falsify or support or uh, force you to refine or challenge uh, or whatever sort of, you know, you go back to this uh, conceptualization, this theory that you started with and kind of use those findings to either refute that or refine it or extend it or what have you. Uh, um, okay. And it's like experiments are a very common uh, method to, to do this. Uh, experiments like in the medical sciences, for example, like your placebo versus uh, treatment group experiments, th these kind of experiments. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point with, with anything. Uh, th this is hopefully going to be much more of a discussion uh, rather than just, this, just me talking, okay? Okay, so this is the scientific method is deductive the polar opposite on this spectrum is sort of an inductive approach to research. Okay, so here, what do I mean by this? So here, um, very different assumptions. Okay, so here, reality is not this objective um, uh, thing that exists independent of the researchers, but rather reality is socially and experientially constructed. Reality only exists um, because uh, it, people share these interpretations and understandings of reality. It only exists through the lens of our uh, understanding of reality. It's not something that exists independent of us and, and of the researchers. Um, so here, people trying to understand reality um, need to explore the meanings that uh, others construct, uh, individuals, groups, what have you, construct of reality, right? Because it doesn't exist independently of the meanings that, that people construct of it, okay? uh, So that's why this is sort of referred to as constructivist in nature or bottom up, okay? Because you usually start with some specific data and you end up with something general or abstract or uh, some, some abstract theory or conceptualization of a particular phenomenon. But you start from some sort of observable data and then you sort of derive this uh, overarching theory. We're gonna talk more about theory next time. Um, and knowledge here is subjective. It's not sort of objectively measurable like before it's subjective. It's sort of subject to the interpretation of the researchers. Um, and this is why collecting 
um, data from multiple perspectives here uh, gives a richer, more nuanced, more interesting, more useful understanding of a particular phenomenon, right? Because it's subjective, right? The more, the more information and, and sort of richness you can build in, the, the more um, useful this becomes. Um, so here, research questions are of a very different nature. So typically they um, explore uh, phenomena to increase our understanding of them. Um, and you usually start with this desire to uh, understand, better understand or explore a particular phenomenon or explain a particular phenomenon. Uh, and you collect some data and then you sort of look for patterns in this data to, to generate this uh, higher level understanding or theory of a particular phenomenon. Okay, so, so bottom up in that sense. Um, and how do you collect this data? Well, typically you do it sort of through interviews, through focus groups, through observations, things like this. You collect data from, from people because, because reality is not sort of something that can be observed and studied independently of the sort of people's uh, prescribed meanings of, of said reality. Um, so it turns out that actually this is part of a much broader uh, line of, of, of thought. Uh, it goes back to sort of philosophical worldviews of science. Um, so th these things are, are um, kind of tied back to sort of two very popular um, patterns or, or archetypes or, or philosophies of, of worldviews um, of science that um, people might subscribe to, researchers might subscribe to. Uh, and that impact everything, impact everything that has to do with the practice of research and the choice of methods. So this objectivist deductive approach, the scientific method that we talked about um, is um, closely aligned with the positivist or the post-positivist worldview, uh, the philosophical worldview of science here. Right? So knowledge is objective, cause and effect relationships, typically uh, so top down reductionist, um, uh, uh, often quantitative, measurable, and so on, has to do with uh, verifying, falsifying theories, hypo testing hypotheses. The opposite, the subjectivist inductive approach is an example or fits in the sort of constructivist or philosophical worldview. Okay, so uh, knowledge is socially constructed, bottom up, and the truth is, is relative to context. Truth is not an objective uh, thing. It's, it's not measurable, it's not so sort of testable in, in, a, uh, in a statistical sense, for example, uh, or, or provable in a formal mathematical sense. Truth is sort of relative to a particular context. It's uh, uh, subject to, to the interpretation, um, open to interpretation. Uh, and here the goal, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I don't know uh, how assumption and the method fit each other. So when you are subjective with, why you need to assume that the, the, the phenomenon or you observe is subjective and then you start with the bottom up approach. Can we assume that the phenomenon is objective but we still use the bottom up or grounded approach uh, to learn about this one? Yes. Um, okay. So that's a good question. Uh, let me see if I uh, understand that correctly. Let me try to rephrase. I was Bobo. Was that you? Yes. There's some weird uh, background noise. So I guess what you're asking is, um, do I have to? Let me see if I can rephrase this. Do I have to tie into a particular kind of method, um, or or rather the other way around? If I if I want to use a particular uh, type of method. Do I have to tie into or commit to this philosophical worldview? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, the answer is no, but so usually the, the, I guess the causal uh, direction flows is, is the opposite. It flows in the opposite direction. So like usually, right? So the, the uh, underlying fundamental thing here is this philosophical worldview is what you consider to be knowledge or, or truth. Like this is where everything starts. Okay, so I guess the way you phrase your question suggests that what you might consider to be knowledge or truth fundamentally so, uh, aligns better with this positivist um, philosophy uh, rather than so the constructivist uh, philosophy. Um, and so 
so this is something that you usually so um, commit to. You commit to this philosophical worldview. What do you consider to be knowledge and truth? This is something you have to commit to. But once you do this, um, once you do this, then it's fair game. Okay, so we'll actually see uh, uh, throughout uh, the rest of today and also throughout the semester that um, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It it's, doesn't mean that if you're a positivist, you have to uh, exclusively use these methods and, and never use those methods and, and vice versa. Okay, so none of that is true. Uh, it's, it's never this simple. Uh, it's, it's fair game. Uh, and in fact, I'll um, get back to this in a second. So give me a second. There's, there's more philosophical worldviews here that actually might, might fit you even better than, than either one of these two. Um, but so the answer to your question is, um, I think you, you commit to a philosophical worldview first, uh, and so that impacts everything else that you do, right? You have to commit to a philosophical worldview. Uh, explicitly or implicitly, you've done that already. Um, but once you've done that, it's fair game. So all methods are, are, are on the table. So there's not, not a, a restriction in that sense. Does, does that answer the question? I guess you're, you're maybe moving or something. We'll come back to this. I said thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get that. Um, you're welcome. Um, so here's two more. Um, these are the four most commonly encountered philosophical worldviews in science in general. Okay. Um, so we talked about positivists and we talked about constructivists. Um, so the other two common ones. There's there's other ones, but these are the most common. Um, the other two common ones are so the advocates on the one hand. So this is an, an advocate is somebody who um, whose research uh, cannot be disconnected from the the population or the subjects that are being studied, and is somebody who is sort of a, a seeking active change in society. So a very participatory uh, view of of research. Uh, you cannot just so sort of do research disconnected from the people or whatever subject you're, you're researching. You sort of do research um, together with the, the, your, your research subjects and with the goal of, of actively uh, seeking change in society. This is sort of the, the advocate worldview um, on the one hand. And the other one is the pragmatist, the pragmatist worldview. So here, essentially, you're problem driven. Uh, if you're a pragmatist, you're problem driven. Um, you're not a method purist or, or a, a inc strategy of inquiry purist in that sense. Uh, anything is, is fair game. Truth is whatever works at the time as long as it helps solve a particular problem. Okay, so this is maybe, Bobo, this is, I guess, what you're um, admitting to, maybe subscribing yourself uh, based on the question you just asked. Um, because here it seems like you're problem driven rather than method or strategy driven. You use whatever methods uh, are appropriate at, at the time, as long as you, so it helps you further uh, uh, towards the solution to, to a particular problem. Okay. So these are so the rough four uh, philosophical worldviews in science of any kind. By the way, you've probably, so far, we haven't talked at all about computer science. We haven't talked about, um, any of, we haven't talked about software engineering. So a lot of you are software engineering students. We haven't talked about any of this, okay? Because actually all of what we talked about is much more general than any of our disciplines are. So this is sort of something that uh, underlies all of science, including our computer science. So which one are you? Which one do you subscribe to? I'm a pragmatist for sure. By the way, there's no right or wrong here. Uh, this is not a. So I thought maybe the... I was a positivist, but then once you introduce pragmatist, then I realized that's probably where I also fall, like Jeremy. It's kind of weird coming from mathematics to say you're not a positivist. <laughs> right. I thought, well, that's why I thought at first I was like, um, I think I lean because I do a lot of theory to towards positivist mm -hmm. but then I realized I do think I am the kind of person that okay so maybe I've been more positivist in the past but I would like to be more pragmatist mm -hmm. because I'm definitely like let's use the best tool for the 
the problem at hand without being biased towards a particular method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same for me. I also thought, you know, pragmatist because my sort of reaction to the truth definitions for both was, doesn't it, you know, sort of depend on the situation and the problem. It's not like definitely objective or socially constructed. So yeah, pragmatist makes sense. Mm. Yeah, um, I would, oh. No, I would, go, go ahead. Pragmatist, um, especially for programming languages since you're working with both a computer and also the human, it's hard to just take knowledge in one way and you have to do trade-offs. Do we have any constructivists or advocates? Uh, for me, I think um, I used to, I, at least I used to think that I, I'm more like, a more of a uh, positivist. Um, but um, actually um, more recently, I think I, I'm more leaning towards actually advocate uh i'm um not necessarily not necessarily um so like not necessarily f doing research for um for for the the uh, the the biggest um uh topics that that we the most popular topics in in society but i'm still thinking that the purpose of research um to a great extent is to Use our understanding of a particular field to um, um, basically make make some changes uh, mm -hmm. for the better, and no matter on any any question. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I'll, I'll yeah. I'm more leaning towards advocate. Yeah. Do you have any constructivists? I think I'm probably like a pragmatist who more and more leans constructivist in some ways. Um, I'm like very much a, myth, a mixed methods researcher. I think most things require mm -hmm. quantitative and qualitative approaches, approaches to understand them fully. Um, and I really think a lot of times with any problem that involves humans, if you don't have any qualitative data, you might be missing something. Yeah, th thanks for this. Um, I, guess, I guess what I hope you, you will see from this small exercise is that like really these are just caricatures uh, and they're oversimplifications and um, chances are a very few of you will fit each of these molds perfectly because none of them is meant to be sort of uh, exclusive in that sense. They're, they're all, we talked about continua earlier uh, and it's the same, I think it's the same here. Like you, you sort of borrow elements from, from each of these. Uh, I personally, like you, you all, you all uh, talked about yourselves. I think personally, I'm mostly a pragmatist like I, I problem driven more than um, more than method driven, but I did sort of prefer um, quantitative methods throughout my career so far. I've, most of my work has been quantitative, um, and I do work on sort of societal uh, scale problems. So that I guess would make me an, an advocate uh, in that sense. So you know, nobody fits into e each of these molds perfectly and cleanly, but actually sort of knowing about these and there are others but these are the most common ones knowing about these is actually really useful um, uh, as you're doing research now in grad school and, and later in your careers because it sort of really um, informs and sort of drives what you're willing to accept as knowledge and, and truth this sort of it's this is what underlies everything el uh, else that, that you'll be doing as, as researchers so it's, sort of, it's useful to keep this in mind as, as a frame of reference Okay, so let, let me uh, let me move on. So, right, so we're talking about how um, methods depend on lots of things. Um, I'm looking at the uh, class goes until what three forty. Okay, good. Um, so here's um, we talked about qualitative versus quantitative. Uh, here's another few ways of, of thinking about how methods are are related and, and when and how to apply them. Okay, so typically you will see people apply qualitative methods when there's very little prior knowledge about some phenomenon uh, that is being studied. That's kind of where these methods are uh, typically applied and most useful arguably, right? So 
this is when you so go into a, a new phenomenon to, to study something with questions of this very broad nature, like what's going on? Like, I, I don't understand what's going on here. Like, what is this thing that I'm, that I'm seeing? What is this? What, um, what's going on? What's driving this? What, what is this? Even sort of characterizing something. Um, quantitative methods, on the other hand, um, have uh, been more common and are more common when there's already lots of prior knowledge about something and you can ask very sort of specific, narrow, focused questions, uh, for example, of the nature of how, how is this different, how is A different from B, like precisely, how is this different from, from something else uh, in sort of measurable ways. Um, that's one. Another way to think about this is in terms of the kind of um, information or, or knowledge that can be um, collected, uh, assembled, built through through these uh, methods. Right? So on the one end of the spectrum, with qualitative methods, you get very rich knowledge and, and information. Um, with quantitative methods, you lose all that richness, but you gain precision. You can very precisely measure things and compare things and estimate things and so on. Uh, so you gain a lot in precision, you lose a lot in richness, right? So this is sort of the trade-off um, uh, here. Another way to, to think about this is kind of um, how, do you, how do you draw conclusions, right? So with qualitative methods, you rely on, on your human interpretation. Uh, so these are subjective. With quantitative methods, you um, rely more on sort of decision rules and, and formalisms and, and mathematics and statistics and things like this that are much more precisely defined. This is actually a lie. Um, we'll have a lot of fun um, towards the end of the semester. Um, I, I've sort of planned um, a couple of lectures where we um, sort of step back a little bit and, and reflect on um, how, um, even with, so it doesn't matter what choice of, of method uh, researchers uh, uh, make, but even with sort of precise quantitative methods, um, two researchers can draw fundamentally different opposing conclusions from literally the same data and, and results. So you'll see how um, really after all, this is a human process, like right? researchers are humans too. Um, and like even these, um, objective measurable things are subject to the interpretation of the human researcher and so the framing of, of studies and so on is uh, again something that's uh, subject to you know, the human researchers doing those studies so you'll see how um, how it's actually really hard to even with sort of precise quantitative things it's very hard to um, escape the subjective interpretation we'll have a lot of fun with this later um, okay and and I think um, we, we already mentioned this uh, uh, earlier. Um, I guess the one thing that I would like you to take away from, from this lecture um, is that even though all methods are flawed, uh, um, as you will no doubt learn throughout the semester or already know, um, it's actually um, useful uh, to, uh, it's often useful to combine methods. Like you usually are able to um, reduce some of the flaws and limitations of each individual method by combining them uh, in sort of useful, uh, uh, well thought out ways. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, mixed methods research throughout the semester, and we'll see lots of examples of, of this. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for of mixed methods research myself. So um, I, I actually I, I really like this sort of uh, strategy to to doing research. Um, okay, a few examples just to illustrate. So there's lots of methods. Um, you're maybe familiar with this. I will. Um, I'll go. Uh, I'll go quickly over these just to uh, refresh your memory. Um, I have pointers to uh, a chapter that describes these in much better detail than I'm able to provide now. So I, you know, just please read read that. Um, I've posted that on the website, and I will. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a note afterwards to, to kind of point you to that to make sure you see it. But here's some examples of methods and how they fall on the spectrum. So this is this is the same spectrum we talked about earlier. So qualitative on the left hand side, the rich, uh, and so on, versus quantitative, precise on the right hand side. Okay. So um, 
uh, ethnographies, very rich um, methods. They uh, lead to very rich information, not very precise. So ethnographies, you, you the researcher, immerse yourself in the environment uh, that you're studying. You uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, if you're studying some, uh, I don't know, like native tribe and the Amazon somewhere, you literally go there and, and live with them for a year and you sort of study them in their own environment. Uh, and you attempt to see the world through their eyes. Um, and you are able to um, ask very sort of rich or answer very rich questions about the, how the uh, subjects think about their, their work, their life, what the problems they have and so on, because you're sort of observing them in their actual environments. Um, and um, okay, so this sort of sounds very, uh, very subjective and kind of uh, prone to biases. It, it is, but, but there's still strategies to make this more rigorous, okay? So one is constantly testing your interpretations, right? Challenging your, your assumptions and testing your interpretations. Uh, another one is triangulation, like combining or bringing in data from multiple sources to see if, uh, if it supports the, the interpretations you've sort of made by looking at so one particular source of data. There's some very famous examples of, uh, of um, ethnographers that have uh, made up uh, uh, things uh, in, entirely. So, you know, at some point we'll talk, we'll talk about, uh, about some of these. Uh, but this is not specific to ethnography, by the way. So this uh, making up data and, and um, research findings is sort of universal and uh, applies to all methods. I don't know if equally, I don't know in what proportion, but uh, certainly applies to all methods. I don't want to uh, pick on ethnographers by, by any means. Um, okay, yeah, so um, ethnographies are limited in the sense that you may get trapped by the participants' perceptions. Uh, and it's typically small samples, right? You're not able to go live with, you know, uh, thousands of families across the world and so study them in their own environments. So it's typically you're working with small samples and you can't really make um, any causal uh, claims uh, from these. So the sort of fundamental limitations of, uh, of ethnographies. Um, you can find more details in the chapter about this. So I'm, I'm gonna go uh, pretty quickly over this. Another example of method, we talk about ethnography. So another example, interviews. So interviews are still very rich. They can, they can provide very rich information. Uh, they're maybe, maybe a little bit more precise than, uh, than ethnographies, but they're still, they're still sort of a, a subjective uh, a method, constructivist method typically. So what, what's an interview? An interview is a structured interaction with, uh, between uh, you, the researcher, and uh, your interviewees. So you ask some questions, people provide some answers, you ask some follow-up questions and so on. There's some structure in the interaction. Um, you, um, you use interviews to try to gauge people's perceptions, opinions, um, to uh, maybe understand what problems they're having, to uh, understand how they're working, understand a particular context, understand a particular domain. You're asking about something. You're asking people to explain something to you. This is the kind of questions that uh, interviews are useful for. Um, how do you make this rigorous? Um, uh, one way is to sort of think well uh, and deep in advance about the topics you're, you're gonna uh, address in, in your interviews. Um, we'll, we'll spend some uh, lecture time later on in, in a few weeks or a week um, kind of diving into very specific do's and don'ts of, of sort of how to design an interview protocol to kind of reduce as much as possible the, the interviewer's bias in, in formulating these questions. Um, and in addition to this, you know, um, kind of like with ethnography, triangulation, cross-validation, um, kind of asking the same question over and over again with you know, slightly different phrasing to just to see if people are consistent in their answers. Um, checking your interpretations along the way, triangulation and so on, like we discussed before. Um, when do you use interviews? What kind of contributions can it support? Um, when you're trying to get at the very nature of a problem, when you're trying to understand the nature of a problem, uh, when you're trying to gauge perceptions of a particular phenomenon, when you're studying a particular process, 
Um, when you're looking for examples of something, you can to interview people to, to collect examples of something or exceptions to some rule or, or, or policy or what have you, or incidents of, of any kind. So these are the kinds of contributions that uh, interviews are useful for. Um, the information that you collect through interviews um, is um, in, in some sense biased because it's filtered through the perceptions and the eyes of the interviewees. Okay, so it's not you, the researcher, collecting this data and uh, compiling this information yourself directly from some uh, uh, raw sources. It's sort of collected and assembled and compiled um, through the filtered lens of, of uh, the interviewees you're, you're studying, okay? Um, and there's lots of kinds of biases that may creep in here. And we're gonna talk at length about, uh, about many of these, um, about how, um, you know, how to reduce these as an interviewer. Um, okay, how do you, what do you need in order to do interviews? Uh, well, you need to find people that are willing to sit down and be interviewed by you. Um, you need to sort of sample them in some, some meaningful way, typically. They sort of have to be sort of correctly positioned uh, to answer those questions that you're asking them about. Otherwise, there's really no value in, in interviewing them at all. Um, and you need some ability to sort of sample a sufficiently diverse set of perspectives. We talked uh, earlier about how these subjective constructivist methods really benefit from having a diversity of perspectives uh, brought in. Um, and that's the, the case for interviews as well. Uh, and obviously you need to sort of prepare uh, the, your protocol and so on and uh, your follow up uh, afterwards and, and things like this. So there's some setup required. Um, hey, Bob, does, kind of method, please. Uh, does, uh, I'm thinking about the diversity of perspectives thing. Can't you, since one of the possible views is that um, truth is determined by context and truth is determined by uh, you know what you're observing isn't this a reasonable thing to do here uh, just to scope what your sample is and say these are what the observations are about instead of getting a diverse sample can you just limit what you're observing um i i guess let me see if i understand the question i i guess what Often is the goal with um, an interview study is constructing, building some theory, right? But building some uh, abstraction, some conceptualization of some phenomenon you're studying that um, is hopefully broader and, and more generally applicable than the 10 people or whatever that you ended up talking to. So in, I think in that sense, it's useful to try to have diversity in your sample of interviewees if you expect to have diversity in your sort of population at large that you hope to apply this theory to, I, I suppose, right? So I, I guess you're sort of yeah. trying. So I'm thinking about doing like interviews in, the, in these like companies that basically only one of them in the world exists so of a certain, like a google for example has thousands and thousands of developers but you want to make conclusions about what happens when you have thousands and thousands of developers you only have one possible sample mm -hmm. um, other companies like this might exist in the future but you would like to understand more about how, how do you separate out like what's google specific and what's specific to just having thousands of people working on something at once i'm just wondering um, so I, I guess so two short answers to this one, one, um, there's of course value in doing this. Um, there's, we're going to talk at some point about case studies as a method, uh, or, or a research design, rather not a method, the research design, we're going to talk about case studies. So I, the Google example sort of sounds like a case study and there's lots of reasons why you might consider doing a case study of, of sorts. Um, so there, there's certainly value in doing this. I wouldn't discount this and two, um, I forgot what, what two was. Uh, well, tell me the question again. Oh, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out like how can you draw general conclusions oh. if you basically can't get a diverse sample? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So um, the the short answer to this is you cannot. You 
in fact, you can probably never draw general conclusions about anything anywhere from any single study. And this is the bad news. Um, the way science in general works is through um, extended replications of, of sorts, either uh, exact or sort of more conceptual theoretical replications, like in different contexts with different populations, with dif different methods and so on, uh, and kind of uh, sort of slowly accumulating and building knowledge and abstracting away, away from these sort of individual uh, research points, study, uh, st individual studies and, and sets of observations and, and so on, right? You, I think rarely, if ever, probably never, um, are able to um, so draw, uh, make general claims, draw general conclusions about anything from any single study. Uh, this is my um, my view. It's only through sort of you know accumulation of knowledge over long periods of time and pieces of evidence fitting together and refinements and so on um, that that sort of knowledge of this nature, of this general nature that you're asking about builds. I don't think you can ever do this with any single study. Luckily, software engineering really values replication studies. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if that's true. I, my personal experience has been that um, they're they're very welcome, and you know, and I I don't think that's true. But I, I mean, I can see an argument for why. Um, replications are not exciting, right? So, you know, if somebody has already done something, it's not as exciting for, you know, you to just redo what they did just to make sure that they did it correctly or to see if you can reach the same conclusions. It's, it's more exciting to study something new. Um, so, I, you know, I, I can see that argument. I think that's for fundamentally why people uh, rarely do replications. It's just not very exciting for most people to redo something that is already known. Uh, I guess the thing that draws most of us to research is this um, kind of, uh, the unknown, right? So, you know, a replication reduces the unknown, I guess. Okay, let me move on. Um, there's uh, experiments or quasi experiments. Uh, so now we're kind of shifting much more in the other direction. We're losing in, in richness and nuance in context. We're losing all of that, but we're gaining in precision. So, um, an, an experiment, a quasi experiment, is also called a natural experiment. Uh, if, if there's some naturally occurring differences that can, um, they're, they're not the, within the control of the researchers or, or they're imposed by the researchers, this, they've just naturally occurred uh, in the wild. Like, um, like, I don't know, things that have to do with natural phenomenon uh, constitute good natural experiments. There's some, uh, I don't know, places that have been hit by tornadoes and other similar places that have not been hit by tornadoes. And you can sort of study, uh, construct a, a quasi-experiment, a natural experiment to study something that has to do with tornadoes uh, based on this. Okay, so um, you examine some of these effects of, of some variables of interest in situ, in, in the place where they've happened, uh, hence the term natural. Um, and these are uh, useful for answering sort of causal effect style questions. Uh, like what's the effect of introducing X, a particular policy, for example, you could have, um, you know, po a policy being introduced in some state, but not in other, you could have so in, in some city, but not in other, there's sort of good examples of, um, I don't know, like policies that have to do with unemployment, with minimum wage, with whatever that have been introduced in otherwise very comparable for example, cities that border or, or uh, half cities that border, um, sitting on the border of two different states, one state introduced a particular policy, the other one did not, but otherwise those you know, groups, those populations are very similar. So you can study the effect of uh, this particular policy naturally uh, because some of, some of the other variables that are at play here uh, are maybe controlled just because you're kind of uh, confined to this uh, narrow geography. Um, or questions like, you know, what's the difference between an X and a Y, uh, and, and so on. What makes this rigorous is being able to um, uh, compile to put together an appropriate control group, right? So when we talk about experiments in the randomized trial sense, like in medicine, like the COVID vaccine style experiments, we're talking about a, uh, a treatment group that gets a vaccine and a, a, a control group that gets a placebo, uh, nobody knows what they got, if they got the vaccine or they got the placebo, and you sort of study which ones die and which ones get better. 
um, right? I'm, I'm caricaturing, uh, but that's sort of the idea. Um, and here, because you, you don't have the uh, treatment within your control as uh, the researcher, you sort of have very carefully have to construct this quasi control group, uh, they call it here. It's not quite a control group because you don't control it yourself. We sort of have to construct this uh, almost control group, right? That, to a, that would uh, give you the ability to, to study this particular effect that you're interested in. Um, so that's, that's the hardest part here. Um, all right, what kinds of contributions can you uh, support by doing experiments or quasi experiments? Uh, things that have to do with uh, the value of a new tool, method, programming language, whatever process, uh, thing that you, you've built. Um, things that have to do with measuring the influence of some particular variable or context factor or, or what have you. Things like this, things of this nature are sort of good examples of um, um, research for which experiments and quasi-experiments are useful. Um, limitations, well, yeah, you're you can't be quite as sure that whatever uh, cause and effect relationship you're claiming is, is actually established because, because um, the uh, treatment is not within your control. You're sort of uh, kind of making inferences here, but you don't have the treatment quite within your control. So in some sense, you're, um, um, you, you can't be as sure uh, about causal um, effects here. And the other thing is, you uh, you need quite a bit of luck, right? So, like, if you you know, if you want to study the effect of uh, I don't know some some rarely occurring natural phenomenon of tornadoes of sorts or hurricanes or what have you, um, you know, you sort of have to have enough places that are otherwise similar be hit by the similar tornadoes uh, or, and not hit by those tornadoes, so that you can sort of compare what happened in, in response to this. Or the same with you know policies of any uh, nature uh, and so on. It's like you need a little bit of luck to find these um, naturally occurring control, quasi control situations. That makes sense? Um, okay, so this is where whatever you um, lose by um, not having control over treatments, over effects here, uh, right? That's the kind of the, the point. You don't have control over this. Whatever you lose from that, you have to make up with something else, right? So, how do you make this up? You make this up. Uh, with sort of more sophisticated analysis methods, more sophisticated statistics that allow you to somehow separate the effect of some variable from the effect of some other variable numerically, computationally, so that you can actually um, so still draw these hopefully causal conclusions from, from your studies. Okay, so that's, um, that's kind of one of the big challenges here. Uh, and obviously, you need to have enough contextual knowledge and domain knowledge of, of that situation to know what these confounding variables and, and covariates and so on are to even, you know, attempt to, to control for them, to separate them, and, and so on. Like, you need to so understand the domain and the context very well to be able to do this. Um, true experiments, um, I'm going to skip over this. We talked about this essentially. So this is what this is like quasi-experiments or natural experiments. But, but here, the treatment is within your control as a researcher. So uh, medical trials are the perfect example of this. Uh, and these are very, very precise. They're not very rich. They don't, um, why, why aren't they rich? So I guess this is worth talking about for a minute. Um, why aren't, I'm, I'm claiming here that doing an experiment of sorts um, is not, it's, it's not, does not lead to rich information. It leads to very precise information, in fact, information that lets you make causal claims, but not very rich information. Why am I claiming this? I think you have to set a specific, a specific goal for this experiment, so it's not rich. Um, okay, yeah, that's true. So they're, they're you know, typically very narrow, right? They, they, you study one particular variable, um, so, uh, they're very focused and very narrow. Um, yes, that's true. I'm, I'm thinking of a different, maybe different uh, interpretation of richness here. Like, um, so someone else, what, what, else um, what else comes to mind when I'm saying that um, you lose richness? Um, you must sample something. You can't really study an entire population. You have to pick individuals from it. 
But so interviews, you can also, you have to sample, you can't interview an entire population. You have to sample a bunch of people to interview. And I'm claiming that interviews um, are richer. They give you richer information. Oh, you don't leave yourself any room for expanding the questions that you're asking or changing based on observations at all. Yeah, so the, the two, two good things mentioned. Uh, one was about how they're very narrow and focused and, and two, I, I guess that's sort of, uh, it's another take of how they're narrow and focused. You, you don't, um, you don't give yourself room to, um, to follow up with, with other things as, as part of the same experiment, right? But you can, you know, you can do more experiments afterwards or whatever, uh, if, you, if you've discovered something else. Both of these are good, but something else still, I haven't heard something that I think is important here. Is it also well, maybe this is still on scope, but uh, like it's in a lab in a controlled environment. Uh, there's like very there's like no context or or like environmental things going on with the 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 experiments. Yeah, that's yeah. great. That yes, that's also great. Uh, that's where you lose a lot of richment richness. It's very yes, um, it's very artificial, right? It's sort of in a in a lab in some sense. It's not it loses all this sort of external context that is otherwise very, maybe very important. It may be very important, we, we don't know, but you're right. You lose a lot of richness in that sense, the kind of the context richness, but something else still. So th these are all great, by the way. Um, can can maybe, you think of anything else? Uh, yeah, sorry. Maybe since it focuses a lot on like I'm thinking in the context of medical studies, but like specific levels and like specific factors that you're looking, you know, at numbers and you don't really talk to the people and you don't really see, you know, get something that you don't expect. And, you know, you don't hear um, a lot, which I think a lot of richness from interviews comes from, but less so in those type of studies where you're completely focused on just the numbers and not really the people, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're getting there. So I, I guess what I had in mind here, the one thing that I've maybe not heard yet, is that um, you lose um, the ability to you lose the why here. You can study the what, you can measure it, you can uh, make causal claims about it, and so on. But you lose the why. You you really they're not. Um, they don't give you any insight into the mechanism behind that causal relationship. You can establish a causal relationship, right? So for example, you can establish that the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine is effective at, uh, I don't know, um, uh, preventing the spread of, 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 of the pandemic. Okay, you can establish that causally people that get vaccinated uh, will not get infected, uh, right? You can make that causal claim with, with some certainty, but they don't explain the mechanism behind, behind this causal relationship at all, right? They're, they're not designed to, um, to help with that at all, right? You don't know why the vaccine is effective. You can establish that the vaccine is effective causally, right? So that, you know, um, you, I don't know, you, um, convince people to, to get vaccinated, but you, you can't explain why it's effective, right? It doesn't say anything about the RNA and the DNA and the whatever uh, sort of the science and, and so on, the mechanism behind why the vaccine works. It doesn't tell you anything about that, right? It tells you that it works. You can make these causal claims, but it doesn't tell you why it works. So this is sort of like one dimension of richness that, that you're losing um, uh, with these sort of very numerical precise uh, methods um, that you can maybe get a little bit more uh, insight into with, with the more qualitative methods. Not in the case of the vaccine, that was a bad example for, for that, um, but in the case of other things, right? So for example, like, uh, I don't know, like you expect to see some particular phenomenon in, in software or what have you, uh, and, uh, I don't know, and you don't, and you know, asking somebody, uh, right, that's, that's been working on that particular software for the last uh, 10 years, right, might, might be all it takes to understand why you're not observing what you're not observing, right? So you know, it, it, could, it could just take a simple, uh, you know, interview or question to, to some person involved, right, to really understand kind of why something uh, occurred. 
uh, and you, know, you, you can't get the why with, with these methods. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, so much for my going over this quickly. Um, all right, so the conclusion, I guess, from today's lecture and from class, this class in general is that all methods are flawed. I'm sorry to tell you this. I'm sorry to, um, I don't know, ruin your day if, if you were hoping that some are, some are perfect, uh, all are flawed. Um, but we can learn about how to overcome their weaknesses. And often, we talked about this a little bit, often a good strategy for overcoming their individual weaknesses is to combine them in sort of meaningful, useful ways. Uh, so that's kind of what this course is going to be about. So let's talk a little bit about um, a little bit about how uh, what, what I'm hoping we get to do together this semester. Um, so I, I, I'm I'm going to I'm the instructor. I'm teaching this this class. Uh, it's just me. We don't have a TA, so that's the, the course staff is me. We're meeting twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays at this time on this on the Zoom. Um, we we don't have recitations outside of of this class and this lecture. So that means that we'll end up doing, uh, sometimes doing sort of hands-on activities in class and you'll know, uh, split you up in groups and whatnot and you, we get to do stuff hands-on as part of, of lecture of class, if you will, because we don't have separate recitations. Um, I am hoping I've added you all. So if you haven't received that email from me or invitation to please shout and, and complain so that I can make sure to fix it. I've added you all to a Slack channel that I uh, just created, uh, I don't know, an hour before class or something. Um, and I will be monitoring that throughout. It's probably going to be the most uh, effective way to reach me besides email. I will also be monitoring email. Uh, so feel free to either Slack Slack me or email me at any time. Um, I respond whenever I can, obviously, as, as soon as I can. Um, I'm also hoping that we can use the Slack channel for you to interact with each other. Um, so it will be kind of a communication hub for the class in general, not just between you and, and, and me, but also between you and, and other students. I, uh, I mentioned this in the email uh, uh, yesterday. I'm hoping to publish absolutely everything that we do. Um, and I. Uh, I, I've made this website, so I'm, I'm going to post slides there. I'm going to post uh, the links to the YouTube recordings of these uh, lectures and so on. Uh, every, everything that can be made public, I would like to make public. Um, and things that cannot be made public, like you know assignments and so on, like you know private materials, other things like this, I will keep on Canvas. I've, I've made a Canvas page for this class, but I don't think I've added you yet. So um, you'll hopefully see that soon. Um, but we'll, we'll use Canvas for you to you know, submit homework assignments and whatnot uh, and to kind of keep the, the private things. Um, yes, I understand this is very abnormal. Uh, and I want to assure you that I understand that this is very abnormal. Um, so the guiding principle for uh, our uh, interactions and, and uh, how this course is going to run the semester is that the number one priority is that we support each other as humans. Uh, before anything else, okay? So um, this is a graduate research class, uh, which means that by, by the very nature of being a graduate class, it means I don't care about grades at all and, and neither should you. Um, that, that's something that you leave behind you once you, uh, once you graduate from your undergrad. Um, but what I do care about is that you sort of engage thoughtfully with the material uh, and sort of, you know, really, really put thought into the things you do and the homework assignments and so on. Um, so really, I'd much rather if you're uh, busy or whatever, uh, unable to complete a homework assignment, I'd much rather you do not complete the homework assignment than, than just do a bad job at it. I just want you to do a really good, thoughtful, deep job on, on the things you will do in the class. Uh, rather than just sort of ticking, uh, ticking check boxes, uh, okay? Uh, and I will support you in whatever ways you, you, you will need uh, throughout the semester as we're dealing with, with all of this. Um, the format is uh, so seminar style, so that means there will be a lot of reading. Uh, most uh, work will actually happen outside of, of this class on your own. Um, I am uh, curating essentially the, what I think is some of the best 
things to read that I've sort of accumulated over my sort of 10 years of, of doing research. Uh, and I'm kind of giving you this distilled uh, list of readings and encouraging you to, to read these. Um, there'll be two kinds of readings, kind of readings about the methods or how do you apply a particular method, what's the standard of rigor and so on, the, kind of the theory of a particular method. Um, so these are very useful because uh, in, in lecture, I won't be able to go in as much depth and, and cover all the nuance and richness that will be part of these more extended readings. So please read those. Um, and we'll actually read and critique um, a bunch of example papers that apply these different methods. You will be doing the critiquing. Uh, so this is kind of the, how researchers have applied these, uh, these methods in practice, just to, yeah, to see um, you know, if they follow the standard for rigor or kind of, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses and so on. So typical meeting is going to be some uh, part uh, lecture slash discussion of a particular method. Uh, today was more lecture than uh, I think we'll, we'll generally have. There'll be more discussion going forward. Uh, so like I'll, I'll be leading this. I'll try to summarize kind of the main points from these different reading uh, materials uh, as part of this, this lecture at the beginning of class. Um, and sometimes we'll do hands-on practice with a particular method. So I'll ask you to, I don't know, um, analyze a particular data set in, with some particular statistical technique later on or uh, design an interview or survey instrument or things like this, uh, like hands-on in, in class. Um, and uh, I will ask you to so present some of these example papers. So there'll be a sign-up sheet and you can so sign up to present to the rest of class some of these example papers. And in fact, uh, I'll also ask you to, to um, uh, critique these in, in, in writing, and I'm hoping we do this as blog posts. So here's what I propose as um, the format for, uh, for homework assignments. So the big thing that I would like you to do is a research project, um, semester long research project that uses some empirical component from the course, something that we will have talked about um, by the end of the class. Uh, using something from the course. And um, what I want here is um, a short kickoff presentation and a, a short video with your kickoff presentation, a couple of minutes or something like this. Um, about a month in, you'll see this, introducing the, the idea, like what's the research question? And so how, what's the overview of the study design? How are you planning to, uh, to address this? Um, just rough plan for how you're going to collect data, how you're going to analyze it, and so on, without actually having done any of this yet. Uh, and a final report at the end of the semester, where um, I expect essentially, you know, a, a proper uh, research paper uh, level uh, of, of, of writing. So, uh, a semi thorough literature review and more detailed description of the methods, and hopefully some results and some discussion by that. Um, However, because I, you know, I understand that some of this may be uh, uncertain. Uh, so while I uh, hope that this is of publishable quality and we can actually get to, you get to, you know, submit some research papers to, I don't know, whatever venue we find appropriate um, based on these projects that you will do by the end of class, um, I will only grade these uh, reports as research proposals. So that means essentially everything but results. Okay, so I'll grade them on, um, you know, motivation, uh, soundness of proposed methodology, lit review, that kind of thing, quality of writing, even if you don't have any results yet. I hope you do have results by then. I hope you get to finish these, um, but I won't hold it against you if you don't, okay? Um, furthermore, um, so it's, it's up to you to organize how you want to do this. If you want to work in pairs, that's fine. Uh, if you want to work individually, that's fine, you know, just uh, talk to me about how you want to do this. It, it's all fine. Uh, I just want you to do a good job. Okay, that's that's what I care about the most. I don't uh, I don't mind how you organize yourselves. Um, and furthermore, it's best if these are aligned with your current research. Right? Um, I think of this class as a service class, in the sense that it's meant to serve you in your research. That's what I'm hoping this class does more than anything. Um, so ideally here, um, you know, you already have something in your research that um, could benefit from or, or involves an empirical uh, component or an empirical study of sorts that um, can align with, with the class. And 
um, I get to help you and, and so on, kind of uh, refine and improve that thing that you are uh, planning on doing anyway. Like that's the ideal. Um, if you don't have anything kind of empirical uh, going on in your own research right now or in the near future, that's okay. Uh, I have, um, for example, some very cool bibliometric data sets uh, that I've been playing with uh, the other day that are uh, excellent starting points for maybe a more quantitative flavored project that you could work on. Uh, we, we could talk about other ideas and so on. Uh, if you want to do something else, we could, you know, uh, I'm, I'm open to, to suggestions here. I want to help you do something. The, the only thing that I uh, ask is that you sort of do something thoughtfully and meaningfully and deeply, that you actually sort of in, engage with whatever topic and, and material and, and whatever data set you, uh, you end up choosing. Okay, that's, that's the only requirement. Uh, um, okay. yeah. uh, for the project uh, presentations, uh, I noticed that they're about a month in, which actually lines up with my SSSG presentation. So I was wondering if the presentations were like of the length that might be appropriate also for uh, the SSSG seminar. Sure, why not? Okay, because <laughs> it would be nice to double up and it's definitely my research can, we've talked about this could fit for the project, so. Uh, I just wanted to like talk, like was wondering about length because I know you said video is the short one, but the is the presentation around like ten minutes. So I, the video, oh, um, I, I was thinking the presentation is sort of the. Um, I, I was thinking that when you do a two minute video, you use some slides as sort of background for your two minute video, and it's the ah. same slides that um, constitute the presentation I'm referring to here. OK, yeah, I mean, I can expand on it for SSG because I think that's quite a bit short. But I was I was just wondering, like, if I if there was like how much I had to expand on it, depending on what the, the deliverable was. Longer is not a problem. OK, <laughs> at least two minutes. I, I think it's hard to convey any idea about a research project in, in less than two minutes. You can take longer than that. That's OK. If, you, if you've already thought about this more, that's OK. Okay, so the big thing is the project, um, and you can do this in, in pairs if you want. Um, there'll be a couple of uh, small assignments throughout the semester um, with some sort of hands-on uh, experience with some of the methods we don't get to practice in class. So, uh, you know, I, I, depending on how, um, the, lots of things have changed this offering of the course relative to the last time I gave this two years ago, including the length of the meetings and the number of meetings and things like this. So depending on how the semester progresses, we might uh, you know, shift some things from, from in class to, to homework and so on. Well, this will, will shift it around a little bit, uh, but there'll be some uh, potentially some small homework assignments throughout. Um, and I'd like you to write, so this is number two. Number three is I'd like you to write uh, some blog posts. Um, we'll publish these on the course website um, where you summarize and critique the example research papers um, that uh, illustrate the different methods. So this is what the sign up sheet is going to be for. You can you can also do this in groups if you feel like collaborating on, on uh, a writing exercise with someone else. You can do this individually. Uh, however you want to do this is, is fine. Um, but um, this is essentially an, an open peer review. So think of this as uh, you being a peer reviewer for this academic paper and writing a short-ish um, review, kind of summarizing the paper and, and discussing the strengths and weaknesses, focusing on the method, the application of the method. I don't care about uh, other things. I, I'm focusing on the application of the method. Right, so uh, again, looking for the standard of rigor here. Like, Have they applied this? Like, um, this method uh, appropriately, and so what are the strengths and weaknesses of the study design as a whole? Things like this of, of this nature. Okay, so that's roughly what I'm thinking of in terms of assignments. Um, quick question: How are you doing on time? Can 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 I get another couple of minutes or so to finish the uh, the overview here? I I think we're officially out of time, but we're off by a minute already. I'm over by a minute. Okay, um, so. Grading, uh, half the grade I expect the research project, um, another 30% I expect the blog posts, um, and 20% or so for the whatever homework assignments we might we might have throughout. This is sort of roughly the breakdown. So really it's focused on research. Um, I guess we will, um, we'll, we'll talk more about this next time, but just to give you a, a flavor, we're gonna go over, um, 
what I think are the most commonly used qualitative and quantitative methods for data collection and analysis in empirical research in computer science in general. Uh, and we're gonna go over this in, in depth. You see a proposed schedule here. Uh, I'm saving the last couple of meetings for presentations of your actual research projects. So we're gonna do those at length and, and, and sort of discuss those deeply. Um, and there's a couple of cool things um, kind of before, uh, before then that are not so technically uh, methods, kind of looking more broadly at, I talked about this a bit in the beginning, kind of, you know, um, subjective interpretation of objective data. And we're gonna uh, discuss some drama that has happened in the scientific community. Uh, I'm gonna show some examples from, uh, from my community, the software engineering community of kind of research groups fighting each other publicly and kind of uh, bashing each other publicly about their work and so on, things like this. So we're gonna discuss some meta topics towards the end. Um, and also we're gonna discuss some of these things um, around sort of typesetting and graphics and, and presenting uh, a lot of the things that uh, I wish somebody had told me when I was in grad school and uh, I didn't have to like wait 10 years to learn uh, by just you know, doing. So there will be some cool surprises towards the end, but mostly sort of focused on, on, on methods throughout. Okay, so let me skip over this. The, um, very quickly, so this is not a software engineering class. Um, probably nothing from what we discussed today was about software engineering and, and essentially nothing will be about software engineering throughout. Um, it's not a class about software engineering. Uh, it, in fact, it's more a class about science in, in general than it's a class about uh, any CS discipline. But because I myself am most familiar with the software engineering literature, you'll see examples of papers drawn from the software engineering literature. Um, if you're not doing research in software engineering, that's perfectly fine. I don't. I think any of the so software engineering specific technical things in the papers, if any, are of any importance to our class. We're gonna focus on the application of the empirical methods per se. Uh, so that could um, not the uh, discipline specific things. Um, number two, this class is not about communication, but it's secretly about communication because you'll be you know, presenting and writing and discussing and doing all kinds of things that have to do with communication. Um, I don't know if you believe me or not, but I can promise you that uh, effective oral and written communication is A, very necessary for successful research and B, much harder than you think. Uh, and I guess, you know, I will have to prove that to you throughout the semester. Uh, it's also secretly about peer review because uh, you get to review all these different papers. Um, really, um, you know, if, if, if nothing else, what I hope you will get out of this is a healthy dose of skepticism towards scientific results in general. I want you to leave this class more skeptical about things you read in the media, for example, or in research papers or whatever, than you came in. Okay, so I'm hoping to tune your BS uh, detector, your BS meter um, by uh, forcing you to think more critically about these different methods in this class. Uh, and finally, I'm going to end with this. So I don't know if you know Ian. Some of you might know Ian, those of you that have been around for longer. So um, Ian took the class, um, I think, um, uh, like two offerings ago. Um, and just, I don't know, a, a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, he sent me this email saying how essentially, you know, you know how when I took your class, I absolutely hated these qualitative research methods and I thought they're useless. And I thought that, you know, why are you forcing me to do this and whatnot? And like, it's a waste of time. And guess what? I just started this new job. And the first thing that I had to do at my new job is apply one of these qualitative methods and, and design a survey and then run that uh, at the organization I'm, I'm with right now. So, um, you know, like, um, it, it turned out to actually uh, be useful despite the, the uh, initial skepticism. So th this is to say that by all means, if you're skeptical about this, please, you're, you're welcome. I, I hope you will be uh, challenging me to kind of, um, try to prove the usefulness of these things um, as hard as I can. Sometimes I won't be able to because sometimes you know, it will take a while before it will become apparent why these things were useful. But hopefully uh, Ian's anecdote is uh, going to resonate with you as well. Okay, so that's that. I'm going to end here for today. Uh, do you have any, any questions? And sorry for keeping you longer.
If not, I will stop the recording and I will see you on Thursday. There's, um, there's two papers I'd like you to skim before Thursday if you get a chance. I'll send an email uh, after class. All right, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank